Hello, good day, everyone out there. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is Dissolving the Divide. And uh, since the dawning of time, it seems that there's been divides of whatever, whatever factors that play into our evolutionary lives. And uh, throughout the time in history, we've evolved uh, different methods, methodologies, sciences of, you know, how to treat healthcare and all this stuff. And it seems that in most recent times, since the dawning of the Rona, as I like to playfully call it, you know, COVID-19, DVOC AI, whatever you want to label it as, um, there's been <laughs> tremendous, ginormous, uh, pol polarized divides uh, all across the map, probably any country, you know. So um, today we're not going to be focused on the whole COVID uh, scenario, but uh, we have Stephanie Mo Davis here to bring some uh, profound insights and uh, solutions, <clears throat> and just overall observations about you know her ex direct experiences and what she's directly involved with her practice and among so many other things that she's researched in. So, uh, with me as always is Leslie Powers, broadcasting live in Reading. Maybe I'll be up there uh, sometime soon. And uh, how do you do? Hello. Thanks, Derek. Welcome, <laughs> Stephanie. So glad to have you here. It's Thank been uh, my yeah, it's been my honor recently to meet you, to um, participate with you in a podcast already, and really glad you're here with us today. So I'm going to let you share a little bit more, but I know that you've been through quite a journey within the healthcare system that's really inspired mm -hmm. you to mm -hmm. do some do something about the discrepancies mm -hmm. and and dysfunctions within it, with an attempt mm -hmm. to really integrate, you know, um, the healthcare system with actual healing. So mm -hmm. I see you as an activist and an, 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 analyst, an analyst and activist uh, here to create a, a new strategic renovation of, of our healthcare and our ability to receive proper healing. So welcome. Tell us a little oh. bit of, about your journey and what inspires you to, to do this work. Well, thank you both of you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. And as I continue on this project, I am directly in the moment evolving and learning and trying to apply some of these theory hypotheses that I have. And um, I'm very much still in route with my organizations. I just want to make that very clear because who and where in history um, unless we were talking about really the Egyptian civilization or you know ancient civilizations um, have combined these aspects of full potential healthcare with full potential healing. And it's thing that many, many of my friends and people within the communities have told me is just a lost cause. They just have told me, you know, give up. You know, you're never going to be able to com combine these aspects of science and spirit, as we like to call it. Um, that there's these vast polarizations, and as we've evolved and become more fragmented or noticed our own fragmentations within ourselves and within the system, it seems as though we continue to polarize broader and broader and broader. And we start to uh, literally poke fun at the other aspect, whether it's the, you know, spiritual individuals completely having lost trust in healthcare or just certain individuals just completely having to lost the common sense within healthcare to healthcare providers who I'm also very connected with feeling very confused and um, you know within their ego around things that go on outside of the system as so far as you know the healing community and a lot of people that we're connected with who are taking their own agency back and they're doing things that aren't necessarily peer reviewed and have all the scientific data behind it, but we just very uh, tangibly, viscerally know that this stuff is working. So from, from my experience, um, I actually started studying Eastern philosophy and yoga and Chinese medicine, pretty much the Eastern way when I was 18 years old, when I was introduced to a dance company who it was their requirement to do six days a week of Ashtanga yoga. And 
you know, naively, I thought, oh, this is going to be easy. I'm young. I'm a runner. I was all athletic. And then when I got into the actual practice, I mean, my I, it completely transformed my way of thinking about Eastern practices, the body, the mind, body, spirit connection. And physically, it took me to a different level because I was not prepared for that sort of an intense yoga stretching practice. I was completely naive thinking that because I was in good shape that I could handle that. It, um, it changed me. It took a long time, but at some point I really started to understand what Western healing and healthcare was completely missing. And then about, I'd say two, three years into that, I had an experience, a direct experience with my own illness. And I'm very careful nowadays to not identify with that. I've seen way too many people identify with their illness as an identity, in particular mental unwellness at this point, and then glorify it. And then we capitalize off of people's, I believe, shadow sides. And so I'm very careful that to, to share that my intense illness was an experience that I needed to go through. I was fortunate enough to have the proper help and the self-knowledge to come through it to a degree where I can look back on it as an educational experience. So jokingly, I often say I have a PhD in the, the human rehabilitation project of when mm -hmm. you're really completely broken down. I mean, guys, I was in a wheelchair for a year. I wow. could not walk. I had kidney failure. I had multiple organ transplants. I was on dialysis for five years. I did not look, feel, produce anything, anything like I'm, I look today. And it's very um, hard for people not to judge a book by its cover. I want people to understand that this is a real complete transformation and, and regeneration project. Not saying that I didn't um, have the genetics I did when I was younger, but I went through a 10 year experience where I had nothing physically, emotionally, mentally. I was completely broke down like the butterfly and had to build myself up. And what I discovered was healthcare had very important aspects um, and focal points that I needed along my journey to stay alive. Okay. It, it's just so, it's just how it was for me. I needed multiple surgeries. I needed two organ transplants. I needed the, the hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis process for myself. There were big requirements that were necessary for me. And um, I used to think back when I was a yoga teacher, this is important to impart here, that somehow I had failed in my natural healing process because I got mm -hmm. sick. And I was actually embarrassed mm -hmm. that I was a uh, meditation expert, a mindfulness expert, yoga teacher expert, and I got sick. I somehow thought that I had failed. Mm -hmm. And I had to deal with my own emotional baggage around that. Um, and the more research I had done, what made my ego feel better about that was that learning that many saints and many mystics and many people who, ha who have um, come through an exceptional st stage of process and transformation physically had to have their own direct experience. It was just the only way to couple the knowledge with the experience. They're two sides of the same coin. So at some point I embraced, this is happening to me for a reason instead of me becoming a victim to my circumstance and yes it sucks and yes some days i don't want to get out of bed and I, I teeter on wanting to give up i had to let myself feel it in order to heal it profoundly yeah so but i also was able to apply the witness because i had the eastern philosophy perspective so amongst my journey i had the direct i'm in it you know, I'm in it, but then also I would get the glimpses of the, uh, the observer and I would be able to say to myself, okay, Stephanie, just stay on track. This is happening for a reason. Just trust in the process, you know, really just be in it and trust what's going to happen through this. So that was profound for me. Um, yeah. and at, at some, yeah, Stephanie, that's amazing. Yeah. And at some point I really go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Leslie. Well, I want to finish. No, you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, they brought up so many points. And, you know, I wanted you to, to clarify a little bit more on that comment you made, you know, what is missing in the Western healthcare system that you learn through this 
this journey of yours, you know, it brought a lot of insights as to what was helpful and, and what was missing. Yeah. Thank you, Leslie. Um, I do have a, a tendency to go off on tangents, so I'm very I'm very grateful that you're here. Um, so my point being, and why I sit here today, is because I'm trying to, like you guys, dissolve the divide. Okay, and I'm here to say that healthcare is needed, but they need a significant mirror so they can see themselves and they can start to level up in what the actual public need, needs are at this point. And this is this is the issue. So my, my philosophy and standpoint with my work is healing and healthcare are both 100% needed. They're actually equals and they're actually opposites of the same side of evolution within the human being. So my experience uh, where I sit today has come from having that experience of where healthcare, Western model, the Western model, model was really, really. Uh -oh. Lacking. And I've developed an overview of what I think is actually going on rather than just having the reductionist point of view of healthcare sucks, healthcare is evil, doctors are stupid. Like I don't, I, I want to, I want us as a whole to move beyond that reductionist view and to actually start to take action to understand if you have interest and value within understanding the medical system is to understand what's, what's actually going on. And then we can apply that nuance to see if there's a way to try to rebalance because there are many good things about the model that need to remain, right? Mm -hmm. The problem is that the Western medical model has become too detailed, focused in their knowledge, and they're becoming insulary in the ways that they're thinking. So extreme left brain as far as evolution and technology. And we still have not integrated what I would say would be the up-leveled feminine aspect of healing. Mm -hmm. So what was missing? First, what I discovered was missing was I'm going to be broad here, was a complete lack of cohesion and congruency and um, a, a model where me as a patient could go in and focus on my healing rather than the bureaucracy of how everything was disorganized and discombobulated. Mm -hmm. That was the first thing I noticed was that I'm here to heal and nothing about this model is pro providing me the coherence in order to heal. So I mm -hmm. felt like I had a full-time job just managing my own health care and my ways around the system, yeah. right? So I had to deal with costs. I had to deal with um, referrals. I had to deal with insurance. I had to deal with the lack of communication between my providers and insurance companies and referrals and Medicare and things that I was having to deal with as a, a CKD patient. That was the first thing that was radically disappointing <laughs> to say the least about the healthcare model was I'm here to heal and I'm literally caught in this tangled web of a complete incoherent mess. Yes. Yes. There are a lot of compartmentalizations too, with the specialties kind of cutting off parts of our body, you know, with diff without real integration. That, yeah. that, it, that was the next layer, I'd say, Leslie, was besides the structural model of the incoherence yeah. was now I'm having also the incoherence of me as a whole being, yes. right? So now I have, you know, I was told actually in my case not to have a PCP because I was too complex, that I only needed to have specialists. So then I have, you know, uh, at one point I literally was seeing every almost every specialist, right? So I had, a, you know, a nephrologist, a pulmonologist, a cardiologist. I had an anti um, or an infectious disease doctor. And again, their direct focal specialties, there was nobody connecting the dots for me. There was nobody advocating for me as the whole being and how these things coherently made sense from a patient point of view. Right. So there's like this very scattered process that also could be very frightening of someone coming into the healthcare system with a diagnosis that's scary oh, yeah. and then having to 
manage, like you said, all of the logistical things about costs and insurance and referrals and making appointments and making the, you know, getting tests and lab work and all of this, these things that you're sort of out there juggling often, you know, dealing with machines on the phone or difficulties with scheduling and difficulties with record transfer, all of that, right? Mm -hmm. On top of then being in a system that is very um, divided within itself based on specialties, right? And oftentimes there's not one individual who has the bird's eye view that's helping a patient to connect all the dots and uh, lead them through a coherent sort of flow uh, of care, I guess. That's what yeah, I'm Are you talking about holistic care? <laughs> yeah, it's as me. opposed to kind of sick care? Yeah, just yeah. real quick. I mean, yeah, to go back to the foundational issues of these things. And, and yeah, Stephanie, this was all happening in America, I want to say, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I was in France, they have a totally different medical system and it's pretty much free in a sense. But yeah, I was paying like Health insurance was was 35 euros a month. That's all it was. And uh, yeah, everything I paid oh. to doctors and hospitals was kind of reimbursed. But yeah, all that aside, it's, you know, and I was, you know, I met, I talked to thousands and thousands of people, uh, you know, through my jobs over there. And uh, a lot of them, you know, they wanted to know where I'm from with the accent. And, you know, like, oh, it's better this and that. And, you know, like some, you know, I've really tried to get in like certain, you know, harsh truths and stuff. And like, they're, pretty much in agreement with me, you know, as far as, you know, all the, what's the difference of over there and over here? Well, you know, like the medical system, num number one, it seems like they operate on a, um, uh, a uh, patient cured is a customer lost mm -hmm. type of uh, mentality in a sense. And it's really taken back to the first cosmic law principle, which unfortunately they don't really implement these hermetic principles into the healthcare. But uh, yeah, like the whole mental state of how they're, you know, going about the healthcare system and you know all that stuff. Yeah, Derek, I'd like to insurance and all that. Yeah, yeah, Stephanie, you're good. I'd I'd like to say, in addition to what you're saying, is um, because all of us here and and this community have had the opportunity to gain knowledge through the you know like the work of Mark and you know we understand the trivium, we understand some of these things and these nuances. Is that discussing first principles and discussing you know hermetics and like we are so far away from that like this like there are a thousand things that need to be addressed before we can we can even have this conversation like this, like there 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 is also i've discovered through my work within the system is that first i want to say not not all providers are evil a lot of them have immensely good intentions to go in and to be of service it's just mm -hmm. because the way they are trained the way they are brought up the fact that there is zero self-development, self-work, mirror work, true integration work within themselves, they fall into almost a mind control aspect of, of and then it becomes something like, I don't know what I don't know. And they, they just keep getting funneled into more specialty and the broadness, the, 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 the abstraction of the whole picture, they just, they, they have lost so much vision you, we have to go way back and really just start talking about, hope, you know, encouraging models of education that also offer self-awareness and keep the providers in direct contact with their patients and the general public throughout their educational experience. Because I will tell you this, one of the projects I did recently was myself as a representative representative of a patient and three other patients um, were invited through Awakening Healthcare into Texas A&M Medical Engineering Department, their, their, their med school. And we sat there as you know three patients really sharing about where our experiences, the medical model has missed the mark for us long-term experienced patients. And it's like we, it's like we were speaking to, you know, um, you know, uh, emotionally immature children, like the knowledge is there, but the actual empathy and emotional literacy and long term repercussions of having these complex issues and dealing with the system, 
they had no clue what where I was coming from or how to even access that within that's me. That's frightening. That's that's very frightening. And what do you think the cost is of that that this trend of of the medical system or the medical care being separate from the the spirit and the mental and emotional health of patients? I mean, the cost is evident in what we see in the world. It's awful. It's we are more obese, more mentally ill, more sick, more autoimmune, more. I mean, it's it's so very evident. But again, because of this disparity in the way that we're trained, we the medical system keeps trying to find solutions and keeps missing the thousand ways we could have upstreamed mitigated and started to cultivate change within the system. So, um, and what has been happening ironically and, and beautifully in an in a interesting way is that more providers are getting sick and more providers are having to have their own direct experience. And I know many providers who openly say, uh, I don't trust any doctors. I don't know where to go. I don't, I don't want to, I'm not taking that medicine that they told me to take. So literally they start to contradict and, and it creates a, a, a a massive cognitive dissonance within their own psyche and how the system is fragmented when they start getting sick. And, and my, my hope within this process of more providers getting sick and feeling disenfranchised and leaving is that they have an awakening of their own. And what I think has happened is that people on the other end of the spectrum, the spiritual demographics have already had their awakening and we're learning how to integrate and ground our awakening. So we have, the knowledge, whereas a lot of people in the left brain community have the knowledge, but have not yet had their awakening to understand the holistic principle of it. So we're, we're, we're coming from this from two different aspects. And I believe that there are people such as, you know, people in this community and other people who are have kind of hit this more middle ground where we're like, hey, we kind of see enough of both sides that we're seeing that we need to actually cultivate better education and resources and talk about this way in which we can work together. But then, you know, we, we, we get into issues around our ego and communication and, you know, can you come off of your pedestal and talk normal to the patient if you're a provider? Like all of the ego shit is getting in the way of having these more conscious conversations. Yeah. Yeah, you They're mentioned the experts, right? Sorry, let's do right. well, the expert. Meant there's a, that's kind of a whole another <laughs> aspect of how our cultures um, kind of tr we're trained to think about. We have to go to the experts, right? So the experts that people are going to in the health healthcare field have a certain training, and you reference right. how they are trained. And I wondered if you could expand on that a little bit of how the training um, is kind of creating this funneling and and the separation. Real quick, uh, just to yeah. add on and kind of reframe, because I forgot to mention this in the whole evolution of, you know, where we came from in, you know, the introduction. But uh, yes, we have to really put a, you know, a big asterisk on, you know, in the early 1900s when, you know, the whole Rockefeller folk, you know, really, you know, infiltrated, you know, the healthcare system and, you know, oh. made the homeopathic community out to be the, the quacks, right? Yeah, because they had the, you know, and that's like the rise of big pharma and all that stuff. So that's when you have, you know, allopathic versus homeopathic really, you know, mm -hmm. butting heads yeah. and allopathic took it over from there. But yeah, as far as like all that training from then and there and like the the textbooks and how they were written and what they left out and what they cherry picked and all this stuff. And like and yeah, things are more compartmentalized, more polarized, it seems, and more specialized, I guess, in a sense. So, yeah, Stephanie. Um, yeah, um, I don't want to leave that out, guys. I mean, there's there's a obvious to us, there's an obvious perniciousness that stems back that's intertwined and threads through all of this. Like there is, but that being aware of that evil that that has existed doesn't really help us today. So we have to uh, find kind of these strategic ways to help to encourage people to. Um, self-discover, I think. I think mm -hmm. within the medical system, what needs to come before this sort of knowledge about what has happened in the past is them being open enough to look at themselves and their own cognitive dissonance to open their soul and mind up to, oh my gosh, could the entire way that I have been trained and lived my life and this purity of my intention 
been so muddled down this path. And I mean, it's, it's shocking. Yeah. It's a shock to the system when somebody realizes that everything that they've been for may have these very dark systemic roots in some of these things that you talk about, Derek. Sure. Sure. Yeah. You know, there's, um, it's, it comes from that ignorance, that sort of tunnel vision, the compartmentalization, the, the occultism, you know, in our world that people go into the systems that they trust to learn to become experts with the intention of helping and doing good work and don't know that history and don't understand how what they're learning is been cherry, very cherry picked and is leaving out great aspects of, of the healing of great healing modalities, Chinese mm -hmm. medicine, homeopathy, Ayurvedics, you know, chiropractic, naturopathic, functional medicine. There's, there's a lot of aspects, yoga, that are left out mm -hmm. and they just mm -hmm. don't have, they're not allowed, even through the licensing and the rules of the system, really not allowed to talk about certain things or mm -hmm. refer, you know, certain procedures. Right. Yeah. And how, you know, how we work here right now in, in, you know, our Western civilization is, you know, on a model of capitalism, unfortunately. And, and what happens is within this world, we do create this scientism mentality where then you are actually glorified and, and you get to, you know, you get to go up the ladder of success if you do what they tell you to do. So it's, it's, it's a manipulation. It really is. It's a manipulation of the mind. And, uh, it becomes very confusing when you could be getting rewards and prizes and, you know, for your work in science. But meanwhile, it's, it's to go, it's to be funneled into one particular way that benefits most people except the patient. Okay. So again, it's a, you don't know what you don't know. And, and to be able to see yourself requires something to really break you to be able to, to go within. And Leslie, like you were saying, I'm not expecting and I'm not advocating for every doctor to become a healer. What I'm really advocating for them, uh, advocating for is the ability for them to open their mind enough to realize that they provide something into the healthcare community. They provide an aspect that's important to healthcare, but it is an aspect and that if they truly care about patients and themselves, they would at least create bridges to healing. That's yeah. all I'm asking is like, I don't need you to become the expert. And I see that some physicians get so disenfranchised, they leave the medical system, they start to educate themselves, and then they want to become the healer. And if, if, if that's their journey, that's great. But I'm saying I don't need every medical doctor to become a, a, a healer in that sense. But what I do need them to do is open their mind and connect with other people who actually will be able to take their patient more into a complete state of well-being. That's what more, I'm more partnership, for. more yeah. openness, awareness, and, and then more partnership. Um, so what would you, how do you describe? Wait, Leslie, can, you, can I just yeah. uh, say something before yeah, you yeah. ask that question? Mm -hmm. Because, um, <clears throat> You know, you know, talking with uh, Dan Arnold uh, recently, we had him on, and yeah, like he suffered some cocktails of horrible pharmaceuticals, you know, in his, you know, demission of uh, his position. But anyways, um, what I wanted to mention is that, you know, what I mentioned, you know, there's a lot of TV programming, and him being like a former police officer, I kind of mentioned that last time and uh you know like all these tv programs they cater towards you know certain genres and like the medical one that's a huge one and i noticed mm -hmm. they really try to glorify glamorize and put these people on a pedestal and actually <clears throat> create these like almost like soap opera mini series in these shows and and they do try to give the idea of all the viewers that's why it's called television programming they're programming people to believe that you know they're you know like these saints and like they really super care and there's going to be like a dozen people around you to help you out like all every step of the way type of thing and, mm. and that's not to say like there aren't people that actually carry that uh true care and passion for that work and i've been like very fortunate to have uh, people you know take care of me and i'm very been very grateful for that and like seeing other 
things in real life and hearing stories that and it's like i can't do that kind of job like being in an operating room you know opening on open heart surgery type of stuff it's like i don't yeah. have like the <laughs> capacity well i i could train for it but yeah folks that you know my hat's off to folks that are that courageous mm -hmm. for that kind of work you know like we do need people mm -hmm. you know? yeah and to to emphasize what you were saying about this savior mentality and how it is it is very much glorified within our very three-dimensional reality it, it's this worshiping of the of matter of the of the of the 3d realm and that you know the the healthcare providers or the surgeon is the savior and this is why you know one of the biggest um you know uh tropes is like you know this the surgeon is the the ego the the god right this god complex that starts to happen and again that's if you're if you're stuck in a materialistic worldview you, and again, that's glorified. So then we we start to capitalize and promote these people as healers. I mean, look at what happened, guys. You know, through COVID, is I was living at the at New, in New York at the time, and you know, at seven o'clock every night, we would go out. People would go out with their pots and pans and start banging for all the healthcare workers. Yes, is there a nobility? Is 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 there? Uh, you know, yes, it's complicated. It's complex. It must have been very, very difficult. But again, remember, that's what they sign up for as healthcare providers, that if there's a war, like a soldier, you, you're in it, so to speak. That's part of the job. That's part of the maturity and maturing within your career is to, you know, you don't need to be rewarded every day after you work, so to speak. But yeah, that glorification and that pedestal completely removes all agency from the patient as discovering the own self healer within. So you completely strip them of their sovereignty, of their agency, of cultivating a transcendent experience with their own health. And it, that creates this split and schism of, you know, you're sick, I'm going to take care of you, I'm the expert. And in fact, it's frowned upon when you become an agent of your own change. Again, we, th they might say this, this is one thing I really realized when I started to interact with more healthcare providers is this happens all the time, guys, is they'll say, oh, we do do that. We do want our patients to have agency. Oh, we do do that. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. And I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, but you're not seeing to the degree that it needs to happen. You're only seeing from a particular degree that you have vision and you've arrived at within your own consciousness. So the intention is we want our patients to have agency. We want our patients to be sovereign, but because they haven't discovered the true sovereign nature within themselves to that degree, they can only express that and mirror that onto someone else to the degree they've freed themselves, which we find within the medical system has no incentives to have a free sovereign healthcare provider. And in fact, now they are funneled so strictly and we're, they're actually losing their rights with the little bit of little bit of freedom they had to cultivate this free agent relationship with their patient. I wanted to comment on a, a few, a couple of things. Um, I think that the, we have to keep in mind the context of licensing and li liabilities because yes, that's both absolutely. are very strong in the medical system and and oper and derive or guide what healthcare providers do or don't do. Right. So, for example, I went to um, take took a, a loved one to. Uh, the doctor because of pain in the abdomen and the, the, the basically the provider kind of split into two parts, the, the, the professional advice and feedback about it. Mm -hmm. And then was very clear to say um, that there was a separation from her own personal experience because she personally mm -hmm. had a viewpoint and, a, and an experience with the same symptoms, but yep. could not make recommendations from her license mm -hmm. about the uh, rec her what worked for her, right? And so she she shared almost like on the side, this is mm -hmm. what I experienced and what helps me. And it was a very kind of holistic, you know, kind yeah. of, a, of a treatment. But she was like, but from my doctor hat, I can't recommend that. This is how we see it over here. So it's very interesting to observe that. And I think that there's a, a 
the part of the reason she ha had to separate that out, we were lucky. I felt lucky she even shared what she did because the stuff on the side was what really helped was my son. And, um, but there's a, and working in, I work as a licensed mental health pro provider and there, there are certain things that, that you're expected to do or not do. And I'm a lot freer than I would say the medical providers where they, like, for example, we saw during this whole um, pandemic thing that they certain medicines they couldn't even prescribe or they risk losing their license. Certain uh -huh. protocols become taboo or un, you know, not research backed in that kind of scientism way. Uh -huh. And and so they're oftentimes, you know, their their hands are tied between their backs about what they can prescribe or not for risk of losing their license or being sued. I think that plays into the expert role too. I mean, even like as a, with the Board of Behavioral Sciences where my license, you know, originates and I do clinical supervision, they are now have me sign a form that says I'm 100% responsible for whatever an associate does that I'm supervising, right? I'm somehow magically responsible for anything they do, no matter what, right? Okay. And when you more and more have to sign papers or you're told things that are impossible, you know, you tend to, um, you know, I could see how, say, a, a medical provider would get kind of uptight about people doing what they say and not doing what they don't say or, well, you know, a doctor saying never put anything in your ear, you know, unless I prescribe it, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. there's that yeah, to, to, Leslie, to add about uh, add upon what you're saying, I want to go back to when you were saying about the abdomen and the advice that your physician gave you these two different things is, again, I was really embedded into the healthcare system for 10 years at prestigious healthcare institutions all up and down the East Coast. And I got to the point where I became very privy about what I needed to do to take care of myself. And whenever I saw a doctor, I would hear their advice and then I immediately would say, what would you tell your daughter to do? Hmm. Because that's the only way I could get the actual truth of the matter. And hmm. most physicians would tell me then. Most would say, well, uh, if it were my daughter, I would tell them to do this. So this level of cognitive dissonance has been going on, I think, in the aggregate of the healthcare provider population for a very long time. They just know that they have been facing the ways in which they've had to butt up and challenge the system and say, oh, this medicine isn't covered, but let me do this and I'm going to get it for you. So actually, I think this is a huge aspect, one aspect of this um you know, current narrative that's been going on with the healthcare burnout is that I think COVID just amplified a gaping wound that was a pre-existing condition of doctors being having to work too long, being glorified for gr grind mentality and working for, you know, tw 12 hours a day every day. It's like a, a glorified militaristic like press and push. Um, so they've been working so much, but then they've also been facing the ways that they've had to challenge the system and they've just kind of normalized it. That is the problem. This is where huge problems start to flourish is when we, we've too long normalized dysfunctions. And we have those providers who say, well, this, but if you are my daughter, this, and oh, I can't get this medication, but let me try this. And, and I've worked with a lot of those providers who've been fighting their own battle within the healthcare system. And now all of this has happened. And now I do believe that that's why we have so many physicians and providers really waking up and saying, wait, you know what? I've played this game for too long and now I'm seeing, I wanna know what actually is behind this. And I'm not gonna continue forward until I actually start to see. And once they start to see, right, what happens? You usually get pissed off first when you start to see more truth and then you can have a, re you know, a revelation. But I think more and more providers are starting to dig and really do their own information. And they, they've just gotten sick and tired of the own limitations that have been pressed upon them. And now they're faced Leslie, like you said, with this big conflict is, if, uh, you know, if I really stand up for my values, I'm going to lose my license. And now what do I do? Because now, you know, I'm, I'm relying on my income. I've got a family. I've got bills. A lot of physicians I know don't pay off their medical school loans until they're in their 60s. 
Wow. So, I mean, this is this, you know, again, it's, you know, going back to how do we, you know, what has been lacking from the medical system and, and what do we have to do? I mean, it's, cost, it's insurance for the patient, it's also for the provider as well, it's the bureaucracy. At some point in this game, we actually start to see that a lot of patients are up against the same challenges. The physicians have and providers have the same challenges that we do as patients. And then we realize, oh, it's actually not us that are so divided, it's actually the system of control that we're all under and we all are fighting the same problems. So, you know, the bureaucracy, the rules, the quality of care, what can I say, what can I say, the political factors that start to come into it. And then we have to go next tier, next level. When we start to realize these things as provider or patient, we have to start to ask ourselves, why is the system so complex? Why is everything so complexified? Why do we have resistance to change? What are the institutional barriers? What are the political barriers? What are the lack of resource barriers? So that work needs to be done within the self. You yeah. need to really say like, what am I, why am I resistant to change? Mm -hmm. And facing the own ego death and what a lot of people within the spiritual community have already gone through and integrated, this is where I feel a lot of healthcare providers and these people with the Western mentality, the matter-based science mentality, they're going to start to wake up to all of this. And I think what's going to happen is they're going to go on the same process that a lot of us had in the spiritual community of seeing all of these things and needing some sort of soft landing. That's what I hope to provide this kind of soft landing to say like, hi, you've arrived. Yes. Yeah. Pretty scary. Right. But don't necessarily quit and fault. Like we're, we actually need healthcare providers guys. Oh yeah. When you go through an awakening, you have physical manifestations that happen through phys through awakenings as well. And we need providers. They just need these people to help guide the experience of when they start to wake up. Yeah. I wanted to point out too, I think, you know, this reconditioning, you know, of outlook is also needed on the side of the patient because be many totally. patients are going in wanting the quick fix. They're demanding, yeah. you know, a pill, a solution. And I worked, you know, for a decade with, um, in a healthcare, a holistic, like a, a health clinic that really was making an effort to be integrative. Mm -hmm. And I would hear that from the, the medical providers that they, they did have a holistic output. They're trying to recommend nutritional changes and yeah. exercise. And they would be very frustrated that a lot of their patients would get very frustrated and not want to not want that to hear that they want the medicine and the pill. So it's, it really is like a, a it's twofold. A yeah. Yep. all around. Yeah, we address that within uh, Awakening Healthcare. It's very much, there's very much two sides to the one coin that we're trying to advocate for. And it is the empowerment of the patient as well. So it's really the, it's really the, um, you know, awakening of the provider and the empowerment of the patient. And um, you're right, we've been trained and conditioned. There was a time in history where maybe we could trust physicians a little bit more and providers and most of our parents have that do whatever the doctor says mentality and um but i, I do believe that the way uh, i believe that how i saw this and tell me if you feel i'm inaccurate here but let's just say the boomer generation or the generation prior to them has had that kind of trust what the doctor says mentality and then I think the Gen Xers had a little bit of questioning everything mentality. And I think the way that the global system is trying to keep younger patients enslaved to just listening to the doctor and losing the agency and staying addicted to just the, the easy solution based approach, you know, like uh, creating all the support groups for the people with the mental health and these are the drugs we take and glorifying these identities. I, I think that's how they're trying to lock in the younger generations to that just giving over their sovereignty is by the glorification of the identity of, right? Yeah. And I think that there, there there are people who are saying like, actually you can heal. You can, there's a lot of things that you can heal from. And if you just follow these steps and do these processes of inner work and healing and take this other journey, you may find that you may not have this particular condition that you once did have. So, um, but it's complex because again, the, the, the evil within, you know, us, the, the, the society, the culture always is trying to re-enslave 
the new generations. And I think they're doing that by these identity politics. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Leslie, did you want to say something? Well, I, I wanted to expand upon like what is real healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And great. how does it differ from what's happening, you know, often in the healthcare system? Yeah. So to, you know, again, I, I think I was very clear at saying there are aspects of healthcare that are very important. Let's kind of shift over into the healing and, uh, you know, healing number one is a lifelong process. Healing is a process. It's not a quick fix. It's not a solution. It's not a pill. It's something that needs to be done coherently with you as the, like the model that the make and model that you are. So everybody needs different styles and nuance of healing at different times. What Leslie, what you're going through might not be exactly what I'm going through or what Derek's going through. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a level of having more of a open level of awareness and consciousness in the healing field to understand that it's not a one size all model because if that's what we're preaching as healers and spiritual people we are locked in step with the same mentality of the healthcare providers this is a one stop shop like one type way we heal like this medication for all people this thing for all people so within the spiritual community one of my missions has been to take something like the chakra system or a map, particularly I, I really like spiral dynamics. So I really like working towards an integral level of, of consciousness and awareness so that we can understand the levels of growth that are below or around or above us and have respect for where people are along their level of evolution and consciousness. Because again, as spiritual people, if we say, oh, we're all stuck in 3D or in the third chakra of ego, and we're trying to move towards 4D, the heart-based level of awareness, well, you're still, you're still claiming that that's where everybody is. There may be people who already are more in an enlightened state, or there may be people be stuck in a survival state. And in fact, when you don't, commit to the process of studying this, you will find that you really bounce around between these levels of chakra systems or consciousness because you have not yet quite integrated them to the level that we need to. I think that we can sometimes pull the, the, the cart before the horse and assume that because we open into a level of consciousness that we have integrated the entirety of the shadow within it, and that's usually not the case at all. So I find that I came through a mapping system of the chakras because I come from the spiritual perspective, right? So how that looks is you start with the survival, the root, the base, your basic needs, very matter-based. Once you start to integrate how the physical realm works, then you move to the emotional body, right? And then remember, you're always having to keep connected to what you've integrated in the prior system below that. You can't go into the, the emotional body and forget about the physical, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you've got the physical, then you've got the emotional, then you've got the identity and the ego at the third chakra. Then you go up to the fourth, which is the heart and relationships. Then you go to the throat and speaking and communicating and listening. Then you go to the third eye, which is your not being disillusioned and being awakened to the broader sense of the world. And then traditionally you would, you would stop at the seven traditionally, which is the state of the realization that we are all connected and we have this kind of unity consciousness. I went through this system and I went through the enlightenment phase guys. <laughs> okay. So what I mean by that is I popped through the enlightenment. I ascended as the spiritual world would say it, but then I was not, I didn't do it in a way where I integrated the shadow at every step. So when I blasted into the enlightenment phase of development, I was not here on this planet. I was so disconnected with the physical, right? And we see this in past gurus and certain individuals, I'm thinking of Ramana Maharshi, who attained levels of enlightenment, but he he, he, he enjoyed those realms of consciousness to where he, or Gandhi, did the physical body just completely deteriorate, stopped eating and taking care of the physical vessel. So for me, that's why I, I like the, the aspect of, you know, the integral spiral dynamics because they seem to have combined with each level of consciousness, the awareness and then the imbalance and the ability to integrate the shadows si simultaneously, like a simultaneity. Yeah. Because I went through the enlightenment, I spent a year completely out of body. 
and as Mark would call it, like this new age BS, like right, brain imbalance. right. So what I had to do was descend through the chakra system all the way back down. These processes of going up and coming down took me personally years, years to, to do that. So that's why I think the, you know, how the chakra system is taught is excellent, but if you're not capable, the mm -hmm. goal isn't to ascend. We're still in earthly form, we're still here in 3D. So you have to level up in your consciousness, but also integrate the shadow so you're able to hold just a much broader lens of reality and mm -hmm. compassion for where everybody is along their state of development. And where I find that the freedom movement, the truth movement gets caught up is that we begin to judge people who get stuck in levels of consciousness or if they're working through a level of consciousness that we have penetrated through, our bubble has burst through that level of consciousness, then we can get very judgmental on someone who is literally just a tier below us and we forget where we've come from. So having the integral level of consciousness and really looking into spiral dynamics helps us to have more compassion for what levels and tearsness people are at and you stop to you begin to not get so hijacked personally when you see somebody at another level of consciousness because you understand that only hijacks your own ability to produce and be in this world is if you are getting so caught up worrying about someone at a different level of consciousness or growth is at or stuck at does that make yeah. sense yeah, very complex, right? Aspects. So healing and health is a very complex, holistic um, thing, right? Or what, not a thing, but a but a energy. Ener it's a combination of mind, body, spirit. It's right? like and bioenergetics, energy. and yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, levels of consciousness matter, and the integration of all levels of our being, which could be, you know, is represented in the chakras. Right. And that right. those are things that typically are not talked about, not even acknowledged or even, ver you know, talked about as real because they're, you know, not verified within our system. Mm -hmm. And so it's like um, the only one small sliver of our being is being addressed. Yes. And one thing I want to just mention that's so important is that as I've evolved, again, we all have the tendency to be egoic when we bust through into a new level of consciousness, thinking that we've mastered it. And really, we've literally only been given, we have been given a taste of it. This is a problem within the healthcare field and the left brain thinkers and with the right brain thinkers. So we ha it took me a lot, many, many, many years to truly understand aspects of true authentic healing. What I'd hate to see would be the medical field start to open up to levels of healing and taking a very novice based spiritual practitioner who literally is just getting introduced to the chakra system for the last six months on TikTok and take them to help teach the providers. So there, there, there has to be some level of mm, really understanding what it looks like within a being to have this higher order system of development. And I wanna read a quote to you that I have here. I, I don't know who said it, I'll, I'll try to find it for you. But what this person says is what I am proposing within the spiral dynamic integral level of consciousness mapping is that the psychology of the mature being is an unfolding. It's emergent, it's oscillating, it's a spiraling process marked by progressive subordination of older, lower order behavior systems to a newer, higher order system. And remember, mm -hmm. it's very difficult sometimes for somebody to recognize someone in a higher order system if they are at a different level of consciousness. They always mm -hmm. say you can't see too much out, further out of your own level of perception, maybe a little bit. But when you see somebody who's really transcended a lot, you're either you either shut that off maybe there's jealousy or you think they're crazy right they always say you know one step ahead and you're a genius and two steps ahead and you're crazy yeah so integrating the psychology really um wonder new psychology i could just say into healthcare would be very beneficial there's very little psychology within the medical education you know 
forget nutrition, all of, they don't talk about any of that. There's very little psychology. So when they see a patient, patient, they have no idea what level of awareness or consciousness or perspective they're at within their physical body. And mo again, think about the medical system. Our focus is the physical healing. They think healing is the physical. Yes. Which if you're going to look at a whole model, you're going to be like, okay, what about the emotional, the ego, the, the, the spiritual, the, the other, the eighth, like there's so many other realms of consciousness. And yeah, how are they sleeping and all that stuff as well. Yeah. There's like so the much more. Yeah. And it's all connected, but we do need these people who have these levels of multidimensional understanding and who really commit to this work to start to share the information. And what needs to happen is we need healthcare providers and patients to not to face their resistance to level leveling up yeah. and the comfort, the comfort that all comes right. from not having to level up. Yeah. Well, we all are, are, beings that like comfort and tend to want to stay there, you know, and really growth comes from leaving the comfort zone and being motivated and it being safe to do so as well. And I think yeah. that well, is it safe within this healthcare system to level up? Is it, is it safe for people to yep. push the envelope? And I yep. think we've seen really clearly it's not very safe. Um, yep. One gentleman I really like and have learned a lot from about these very complex group dynamics and integral levels of thinking is Daniel Schmachtenberger. I've been pretty much obsessed with this guy for a long time. And um, he's brilliant and just has this capacity to see so many things on so many different levels. He's He appears to be very left brain because he's very smart. But to me, it, it it makes sense what he's saying. And he often says that in the West, particularly, that we need some sort of um, like ritualized discomfort mm. to, to break, to evolve. And I think that's why we see a movement towards psychedelics, because it's a way to really pull somebody out of their comfort zone. Sure. And just to, just to give my um, two cents on psychedelics, I kind of lie in the middle. I'm not really for it, and I'm not really against it. Um, what the trappings that I've seen is that it can take somebody in a specific realm of awareness and perspective and really open them up vastly to a higher level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. But there's trappings within this if you're not uh, hanging out with the right crowd or having this kind of level of discernment. You see too many people start to rely on plant medicine for ceremony. We see a lack of integrating the process. And I've actually worked with clients who are stuck in realms or dimensions and, and, and able to ground. So I have a, a person that I've been speaking to his parents quite a bit who's stuck in what's called a K-hole. So he was a young gentleman who had very severe depression and had tried all the medication, which made him worse, made him have bouts of psychosis. And um, eventually somebody along the, the, went through the medical system, nothing helped, went through the mental health, nothing helped. And somebody, you know, one of his doctors and recommended ketamine. And what happened was he was about 17 at the time. It took him up too far too fast. And he's now, he, he literally can say, I am stuck in a K-hole and I'm experiencing psychosis, but I don't know how to come back down. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of trappings within yes. plant medicine that we need to be very aware of. And we also need to, I think, you know, Johns Hopkins specific institutions are now all hopped up on psychedelics as this is going to cultivate the global awakening. And I'm not saying that it won't, but if you don't have these people who understand integration and, and the goal is to not need any of those plant medicines, it's just to evolve in our consciousness without our restrictions and limitations that we place among our own psyche and ourselves, yeah. uh, we could end up in another problem yeah. where everybody's very out of body and very disconnected from the grounding you have to reintegrate the, the proper left brain with those right brain kind yeah. of experiences yeah. as well. It, it brings up to me a dilemma that we have. So one is about proper assessment, you know, in a holistic assessment, which I think is always really important. And so a holistic assessment is going to be looking at mind, body, spirit, and many aspects of personhood, physicality, spirit, energetics, environment, so, social, economic, like this whole holistic view. And like you were saying, um, for, for this to be most effective, the 
guides, you know, I see like instead of having an expert model, more of a of a guidance model, um, come with a person who's able to help assess the the holistic needs of the person and then help partner with an individual to create a plan. So so like you were bringing up this whole the pitfalls, there's pitfalls with all, you know, probably any aspect of a prescribed modality, whether it's psych psychedelics or a pharmaceutical or uh, a practice of any sort, if if it's not seen on an individual basis, really looking and, and assessing a person very individually, then there's a risk of things going sideways, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I think that there's a certain extremism that like people have developed. You were mentioning in, earlier on that some people in the spiritual holistic health model are totally rejecting the medical system and mm -hmm. people in the medical system are rejecting alternative medicines and complementary you know, uh, methods. And so there's... Um, these, this extremism going on. And even like in mental health, like with the, we talk about the green language and I see in the freedom, a lot of the truth talkers and freedom movement, they'll say, ah, therapist, the rapist, never stay away from them, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a pitfall as well as being too rejecting based and making quick judgments, um, creating this like apprehension yeah, I think that, um, you know, there's so much you said, Leslie, and I want to talk about the assessment. But before I talk about the assessment is, is this rejection model is, you know, when I came into this, I was very much of an of an outlier who worked with individuals from more of a multidimensional perspective. And that just evolved naturally through my having wellness centers and teaching yoga is because of the way I was working with people, people would approach me then and say, can I talk to you after class? Do you like pay? Can I like have a session with you? Because I was opening these levels of their awareness that they weren't maybe used to addressing. They liked the meaningful, deep conversations. They liked the soulful interactions. They felt comfortable and safe with me to have a sort of confession without judgment. And, you know, there were so many levels of need that I, I started to see that was happening, but I didn't have a specific medical degree, right? But I knew that whatever I was called to do there in that moment was visibly helping, but I also realized my own self-responsibility in that position and understanding that if I'm here placed with another individual as a source of sharing, caring, teaching, um, I need to be very, very careful. And, you know, I think that sometimes the education model can provide a false sense of security of I have the answers. Mm -hmm. Whereas because I didn't have that educational model, I knew I didn't have all the answers. I was exceptionally humble. I was exceptionally willing to shift my worldview and evolve and admit I was wrong. I mean, I was so grounded and humble in my teachings because I didn't have that piece of paper to rely on. And I think that this is an important thing is that that level of humility with the professionals needs to always be right next to that piece of paper or degree. And mm -hmm. every moment I would say to myself, I realize that what I could be doing um, might turn out to be not the best result for my client at this time. And I have to be willing to accept that we're having an interaction, but I am by means no way the, the expert, and I started to realize that in order for me to do this with a state of humility, I had to keep pushing and kind of being that mirror, but instead of projecting what I felt they should do for them, I had to keep re reverse engineering the process back onto them becoming more sovereign and empowered and 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 live being the the author of their own journey and i think that's one of the trappings that we get into the professional world and why people reject the therapist the the the, the traditional therapist is because we are still very much in this development of shedding that mentality of i'm the expert and you're not and i think the therapists 
certain therapists are attempting to do what I just explained is to say, wait, I have an expertise in book knowledge, but I don't have an expertise actually in you. And I'm here to share with you and care with you. But actually, this is about you discovering the system that works for you. Now, again, if somebody has severe mental health issues or psycho, like, yes, I understand that at sometimes that protocol is not going to work. But I think what humanity as an outlier in general has an issue with with the way the the current therapy model works is that it's ongoing it never gets better you're on medicine you have to keep going back week after week after week and you're relying on advice more so than firmly kind of integrating these more complex nuances and somebody like you leslie i would assume is already doing that but in at the world at large again it requires a level of self-work that most medical providers don't have time or aren't incentivized to do to be able to hold this mature space with their patient time and incentive time's a big one especially in the medical um average life of a, of a physician or PA is they're booked really heavily and may have, you know, five, 10, 15 minutes max per patient. Right. Right. And so when is there time to do a holistic assessment? How do you, you know get what to I, know your yeah. patient? What I, what I suggested to some providers and it kind of, I think got lost in translation subtly, but was because of the lack of time that they have, um, was to use their patients as mirrors for their own self-development. Mm. And, and again, I think that this might go on kind of unconsciously, but I think that if the provider was a little more aware of the triggers that their patients were showing within them or their coworkers, I mean, there's such a radical la lack of trust back in that medical model of not only mm -hmm. providers with patients, you know, a lot of providers don't trust their patients. They're like, oh, I tell them what to do and they don't do it. They really don't care. They really don't care. There's a radical lack of trust between patients and providers. There's a radical trust between providers amongst other providers. It's like, this is like, this is like grade school behavior. Yeah, you're so right. But they if they're the providing them drugs and everything, you know, that kind of stuff. And because, yeah, they get the kickbacks from the pharmaceuticals. We had James Cordner on. We kind of spoke about that. That's why I had like the blue pills in the background, like the blue pill is symbolic, you know, go back to the Matrix movie, even, you know, the number four, like it was sedating him pretty much, you know. Yeah. I and, I, and yeah, yeah I it's have not to, like I this. Have yeah. <laughs> I just want to say I want to just subtly push back on that and kind of steel man that is. I, I believe that you're right, that there there's a, yes, are we captured by Big Pharma? No doubt about it, <laughs> no doubt about it. But what I'm saying is I think providers individually is what, what I've seen and I've heard is some providers say, I'm trying to give you what you want. I'm trying to make you feel better. I'm trying. So there's this lack of nuance of what's really going on there, right? And then again, there's also those patients who are like, I want to feel better fast. And there's this muddiness between like, how much would a provider encourage a patient to suffer before they give them something to help? Now, if you look at somebody like the shaman, suffering is how you grow. Suffering, being in the pain and being in the darkness and being in the pit, that's how you evolve. That model, I could assume, would be terrifying for any modern healthcare professional because of the liability and the insurance and like they yeah. they can't they, they literally can't let their patients suffer like that yes, because there's so one right. one one sue and they're done yeah so we have to change the incentives and kind of just brought the leslie back to the assessment having a holistic assessment i mean i want to work on this with you guys would be killer but no doctor would have any idea what to do with that Mm -hmm. So what we need to do for now, that's a great ideal, maybe not in our lifetime, but what would be better is let's have a more holistic assessment and then at least have the providers to be open to say, oh, I'm seeing this patient has an exceptional amount of emotional dysregulation and I don't have time or wherewithal to handle that. They said the therapist, the cognitive B CBT didn't work. Here I'm connected with providers and people within my community who have this specialty. So if I can create the relationship between these individuals who work in alternative means of health care, then they're no longer necessarily 
liable if they say, I am not liable, but I, I'm connecting you with these people outside of the system. And if you find more help with that, that would be great because I actually care about you. Yeah. Yeah. I think that many, many providers would be open to that type of integration and that collaboration. Yeah. And um, I, I really uh, think you hit on an important issue about a lack of trust, that mutual lack of trust. And I think uh, it would be, I would love for you to expand on that a little bit more. And then just to look at our time frame, we have about 15 minutes and I want to give you also an opportunity to talk about where you're going uh, with your, you know, the vision for the work you're doing Great. and share more about that. Yeah, it's totally, you know, a part of the solutions. And, and yeah, <clears throat> when, you know, regarding what Leslie asked you, yeah, try to see how we can, you know, find solutions towards, you know, some of these issues since we're running out of time. Oh, la, yeah. la. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think I can I can do this briefly. Is, so yeah. um, finally, finally, it's taken no me a long time because this is a huge, huge issue. And I can't pretend that I have the solutions or the answers, but I, I just want to share, uh, you know, where I'm at. Leslie, just to kind of answer your question about the trust. I mean, listen, when we don't trust somebody, we have to look within ourselves to understand why we don't trust them and and then maybe to say well why am i continuing to be around this person or organization if i don't trust them so there's a lot of layers of self that need to go into trust mm -hmm. and again i think unfortunately a lot of systems operate like high schools whereas it's normalized to gossip to to talk bad about people to manipulate to judge to be totally unconscious emotionally to have this emotional illiteracy it's just I mean, I, I couldn't even go into a system like that and work at this point. There's just no way, right? So again, we've normalized, uh, you know, an, an adolescent mentality in, in high profile systems, which is crazy. So I think that, you know, the trust comes back to the self is if we're not trusting each other, it's because you're not trusting yourself and either who you are or where you need to go or what you need to do to get there. Yeah, that's such a good point, Stephanie, because ultimately that brings it back to know thyself and the, and the mentality that we are responsible ourselves for our own health and our own health care. Absolutely. And that ultimately it's not about looking to some external expert to tell us about ourselves or tell us what to do, but to gain information, glean knowledge, and then discover for ourselves our healthcare paths. Yep, and you know, honestly, I I do I pray for these healthcare providers to understand their role because yeah. when we get them out of their ego and we get them into the place of I when you are free, when you work on your own inner freedom, there's no possible way in hell that you would want to enslave somebody with your sole opinion or expertise about something without including the radical self of the other. There's just no way you'd want to do that. And this is where we need to help encourage the, ed the medical education and their providers to be at is this more integrated state of awareness where they honor and appreciate the awakening and evolution of somebody's health within their own understanding. Gosh, we see ourselves yeah. through the reflection of others. So, you know, we go to the primary care and the lens that they're seeing our issues. We can gain that information, but not see it as the end all be all. Get the, you know, uh, perspective of a chiropractor, which is different from the physical therapist, which is going to be different from the yoga, yoga expert, which is different from, you know, the holistic dentist, you know. And I think that when we can take on that responsibility to understand ourselves, um, you know, and like respect like each perspective, but not put it on that that expert as the one to give us the answer or to heal us. You know, we didn't even touch on the level of provider, and this happens with spiritual teacher or guide or whomever too, is the level of transference and counter transfer, mm -hmm. things that can happen between provider and patient. Could you imagine that your PCP or the doctor that you spend time with is, yes, they have knowledge in the mind, but some of their suggestions to you are coming from their own projections? For sure. Yeah. Right. And this happens all the time, even though they're taught not to do this unless you've embodied the process, you're still doing it. Yeah. So it's yeah. very important. Like we're, we're, 
you know, of course we are where we are because we need more awareness and integration. But just to kind of wrap up, guys, with what I'm doing, um, I, uh, you know, started uh, regeneratinghealthcare.org with a physician um, that then stemmed into what's called awakeninghealthcare.com. And um, I, the actual direct experience is I realized that I was not going to be heard by anybody within the system because I don't have a degree. Outliers are not welcome. So I had to find a healthcare provider who had my same values and wanted to try to up level aspects of healing and healthcare to work with. So, and her and I have a lot of conflict at times together because we come from these two different polarities, but we care enough about the future of healthcare and patients and sovereignty to be able to try to make this work. So Awoke, Awakening Healthcare is a nonprofit where um, it's, you know, the me and my uh, partner, Dr. Shaw, are the ones who are the, 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 pro the program directors of this, but we have a board, we're getting together and things are rolling for us. And what the, the general mission is, is that we want to provide programs and resources to up level the awareness in medical system education and in hospital institutions and clinics at large. But because the rate of change is so slow and there's so much entropy that we have to break through, for us to implement one little shift or to get this patient program into the medical system took so long. But it, they're starting to wake up a little bit. So we're starting to get in the system. So, but again, once we go in, we hit all the barriers, the bureaucracy, the money, the insurance, the liability. So every time we go into something like that, we got to get through this distortion, but there's enough leadership within certain aspects, certain aspects of healthcare right now that realize, wow, we are radically broken and we've been saying we're broken for many, many years, but I actually have to step up in my leadership and face some of these systemic barriers to do something about it. So we need to connect with the right leadership to even start little, my colleague says, tiny pathetic steps. <laughs> models, systems, tiny pathetic steps. It's going to take for a long time. So in the meantime, we have these two arms with Awakening, Awakening Healthcare. One is really representative of Ruby as the physician, and one is really representative of me as the outlier, um, you know, spiritual healer as that other alternative holistic aspect of things. So Ruby spends most of her time, she teaches, she's a professor as well of educa uh, medical education. So she's doing these tiny pathetic steps with talking to leadership, implementing little programs, shifting little things. We commune often to, to see where we're at with these realms. And then my aspect of things is right now I'm advocating and about to propose a brick and mortar space that would be almost like um, a trauma integration center, a, 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 a self-development center mm -hmm. for the patients and providers who are looking to get their unmet needs met in the meantime. So again, we might not have this merge, especially in my lifetime, of all of these theories and concepts. Are we going to have an integral state of consciousness within the healthcare institution in my lifetime? Probably not, right? But so what we can do at least is to create a relationship between this system and little ways in which we can change that and then have a direct bridge and a relationship between these self-development centers that patients are getting these deeper needs and knowledge and understandings, getting the information there for them. And that's going to be patients and providers. It's really anybody who's waking up to this broader scale. And then the goal is to not keep these things separate. So the goal is the brick and mortar, the first one that I'd like to create. I'd like to have multiple, but the first one I'd like to create, it needs, it's essential to have an ongoing relationship between these centers and what goes on with the patients in these centers with the hospital institutions clinics and medical schools so we can start to inform each other of true care and healing alongside of healthcare. Mm -hmm. that's exciting wonderful yeah thank you i appreciate that it's been very difficult um, as an outlier of the system to stay advocating for them and not just want to tear it down. It's been very yeah. hard. 
Yeah, a lot of patients required for that step, little bite-sized steps, you know, along the way. And I do think that that's true for our all of our endeavors, you know, here to dissolve these divides and and bridge differences um, to bring people together, is is in with a lot of patience and perseverance and very small steps towards a clear, um, you know, a clear vision, clear, clear vision. Yeah. yeah. And there, there needs to be different layers of ground crew to do this. We still need, you know, the, the warriors on the field standing up to evil and tyranny. We still need the voices. We still need people to challenge the status quo. And we need those important voices that, you know, there are doctors now doing this and we, we yeah. desperately need more, but I kind of envision awakening healthcare as this community-based, like let's these unmet needs, that feminine perspective of care. As, as we're doing this, as we're trying to face this tyranny and this control and this, this evil, let's to be boots on the ground with helping with the unmet needs and trying to educate at the same time. So we really need this divide, this leveled up masculine to be fighting for the health of the world and the system, as well as this leveled up female who says, I see the tyranny, but I'm not angry. I'm actually working on boots on the ground systems to help people evolve when they need help. Yeah. And all the time, um, kind of working with this censorship that's happening, right? And trying, because I see this model that you're describing in the approach as a way that can maybe go under the radar of this censorship, which is happening, you know, in response to like really more extreme kind of stances, then all of a sudden it's shut down, right? And your, this integrative model, I, I feel that you're talking about is something that's really embracing the people, you know, that we want to work on helping it promote their growth, you know, and change. Yeah. All right. Yeah, Leslie, we're going to do all we can to try to um, avoid the, the censorship, as you were saying, instead of pressing up against it so rigorously and pissing people off. I mean, obviously, I don't I've been working on this for many years and I want to try my best to be strategic and to be accurate and authentic um, again. So I think that there has to be the people who are boots on the ground fighting against the, you know, the tyranny and the evil. Um, but we still need to care for the people who are suffering, who aren't getting their, their needs met um, with health and healing and who need help. So I'm hoping that we don't get censored. I don't know, the awakening healthcare might set off some alarms at some point. You know, again, from a lot of the medical model I see on Instagram is, you know, they already think that they're woke. Um, but, you know, from the real process, we realize that we never really achieve the wokeness, that it's just a, a pr constant process of awakening. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we're doing our best. And, uh, you know, I'd love to keep you guys posted as we go along. And, uh, yeah, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate what you guys are doing. And, you know, trying to dissolve the divide is a huge thing um, in any system and within our own lives. So thank you, guys. Yes, thank you, Stephanie. It's been wonderful uh, having Thanks. you on our, our little show here. Yeah, my pleasure. See you back down the road. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, guys. Yeah, definitely. And this show is not sponsored by anyone you Pfizer? might have <laughs> yeah, yeah. Things and, you know, but certain side effects might include, you know, expanding your horizons and being encouraged to know that there's tiny, pathetic <laughs> steps <laughs> that are groundbreaking in that profan profound uh, way but they're actually creating and bridging gaps and you know creating new uh, you know a pathway towards you know this better way of health and, and just addressing people's health and and that whole journey of that process you know we we all understand that even the whole awakening process and like people want to throw out you know, woke you know that's a four-letter word and it seems like they're bypassing a lot of stuff they just want to have some kind of ego attachment to any kind of title of these compartmentalized things and oh you're an expert and this and that and then, and that's great you you know went through umpteen years of school and money to to get where you all are but there's so much ego attachment to that and if you you look at the you know solutions as well we, there is a form of sh collective shadow work that needs to be addressed and done on so many different levels within the whole medical industry and uh to kind of humble people as well uh, you need not 
<laughs> need not look further than some statistics, you know, black and white right there of, you know, just uh, like the third, the top five leading causes of death. What's in there? You know, one of them, you know, the whole medical malpractice, uh, all the stuff, overdosing, uh, you know, bad prescriptions. And the rest are really lifestyle. Nice. So that's up to us, the patient. Yeah, we yeah. we have a lot of more power than we realize. Absolutely. Right. You know what, guys? The, the world has changed. If we haven't noticed, it's gone exponential. Time is moving so quickly. It's changed. It's past where we are already. So we need to really kind of remember and humble ourselves and see where we need to improve because it's not slowing down anytime soon. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm trying to be courageous and be open to this ongoing change and confront my ego when it wants to stay stuck or in a spe spe specific philosophy or mindset. And that's, you know, if we could just get that message out, I think that'd be a great yeah. first step. Yeah, sounds good. Open mind. Yeah. Eagerness to grow and learn. All right. Well, thanks again, Stephanie. We'll catch you on the next project. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Have a great All day. Right. You yeah, too. Yeah, look forward and supportive of, you know, what you got going on. It's very inspirational. So, yeah. Thank you. Oh, I appreciate work. it, guys. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.